This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. The Supreme Court has issued 20 opinions in argued cases so far this term, and 15 of them have been unanimous. That may seem unusual for a court that's often split down ideological lines in controversial cases since the three Trump appointees joined the court, leading to a super conservative majority. But Chief Justice John Roberts has often talked about the importance of unanimity. I still think it's an important objective. Um, One, because I think judicial decisions should be narrower rather than broader. And the way to do that is to try to get as many people on board as you can. That, um, uh, you know, if you're going to reach a broad decision that's going to cover all sorts of different uh, factual scenarios, a lot of people are going to say, well, whoa, I'm not quite sure I agree with that. Uh, And then they might write something narrower. But if you keep it narrow that it only is decides what's absolutely necessary to be decided, usually you can get more people to agree with that. But in the next two months, as decisions are handed down in controversial cases involving abortion, guns, racial gerrymandering and presidential immunity, you can expect that unanimity to evaporate. Joining me is John Elwood, the head of the Appellate and Supreme Court practice at Arnold and Porter. He's been before the justices many times. For those who are not familiar, will you explain the process the justices go through in making these decisions once they've heard oral arguments? Sure. Well, the Supreme Court hears arguments for basically two weeks every month between October and April. And at the end of, I think, each week of argument, they vote on, you know, which position everyone's going to take on every case. And I believe that at the end of the whole sitting, there's a kind of a final tally where the person who is presiding, that is the senior most justice in the majority, assigns opinions to all of the justices in a way that tries to give them kind of an equal share of cases, an equal number of authorships. 20 opinions and argued cases this term, 15 have been unanimous. I know the Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Coney Barrett also has talked about how, you know, we're unanimous on the majority of cases. But tell us about the kinds of cases they're unanimous on. Well, most of the cases that have been decided so far are not the kind of red letter, big ticket to mixed metaphors cases for the term. They're more generally uh, the duller cases. There are a few cases that are more noteworthy, which were nonetheless unanimous, which were likely unanimous because they were so narrow. Like, for example, there were the social media blocking cases, Linky versus Creed and O'Connor, Ratcliffe versus Garner, which involved uh, a fairly big ticket issue about uh, whether when public officials block people on social media, that is essentially state action that is regulated by the First Amendment. And that was a case that really the justices seemed to have some trouble grappling with an argument. But they decided very little of it. They decided a fairly narrow rule and left most of the application for remand. And so I think that would have been a a very easy case to not be unanimous if they had decided it any more broadly than they did. So are they trying to present a picture of unanimity with these cases by, as you say, either limiting them or, you know, choosing cases that are not hot button issues? Well, to begin with, one of the Uh, things I like to emphasize is that when you're dealing with such small numbers, it doesn't take much for things to seem like outliers. You know, when you're dealing with just like 18 cases, um, it only takes something like four extra cases to go from an ordinary term to a really unusual high watermark of unanimity. And so this is something that I always try to emphasize when you're dealing with the Supreme Court, the numbers are so small that it doesn't take much for things to look like you have some real outlier term or real weird trend. But with that, you know, I I do think that the Roberts Court does try to emphasize unanimity. Also, uh, there may be a different dynamic in that, you know, they're trying to get cases out because they are relatively behind in getting opinions out. And so they may just, you know, be writing opinions narrowly so they can clear those cases out, get them out so they can focus on the remaining cases. So there are a number of reasons why they might be doing it this way. Uh, I do think that they try to be unanimous whenever they can. 
it's kind of part of the ethos of the Roberts Court. John Roberts cares about it, and I think he tries to jawbone other people into feeling the same way. It may be that they're taking relatively few cases. There are a very low number of grants this term, and it may be that they are, you know, picking out cases that they feel there's a fair amount of unanimity in. And it may be that they're, you know, kind of clearing the way for more contentious issues which have uh, yet to be decided. Every year, the cases that we're waiting for involving hot-button issues come down at the end of June, sometimes the last two days of June, before they go on vacation. Is there a reason for that, or is it just a decision to leave the most controversial cases until the final days? I think a lot is just explained by the practicality of it, which is that dissenting opinions take more time. And sometimes in the most contentious cases, there's back and forth between the dissent and the majority opinion. And when people are fine-tuning opinions, you know, in draft after draft after draft, it can go kind of down to the wire. So I think much of it is explained simply by the practicality of, you know, more opinions, more drafts take more time. And will you explain the process of circulating the opinions so all the justices see what others have written and can respond to it? That's right. A majority opinions circulate, dissenting opinions then circulate, and each subsequent draft is then circulated to the entire group. And then, you know, justices who are joining opinions may ask for changes. Justices who are joining dissents may ask for changes. Authors of both majority opinions and authors of dissent may tweak their opinions to respond to the opinions on the other side. And each of those opinions will be circulated to the whole group with a red line so everyone knows what's new and what's been changed since the last draft. I guess that does show why it takes so long. Now, as far as the oral arguments go, and everyone says you can't tell what the decision will be from the oral arguments, but can you sort of figure out the broad strokes of the decision from the oral arguments? Have you ever been totally surprised by a decision? Like, wow, I never expected that. There have been some that surprised me. Um, There was a case many years ago when oral argument was still in a pretty rigidly one-hour format where there was actually kind of a reversal of position. The position that Justice Stevens seemed to be advocating wound up being taken up by Justice Scalia and vice versa. But I think especially under the new format, which essentially goes on as long as the justices have questions, I think oral argument is a much better predictor of where people are going to come out in the end. There are fewer surprises, I think, under this sort of format because all of the issues are thoroughly ventilated. The court, it's been said a million times, but it's at its lowest approval rating since they've been taking those polls. Do you think that that matters to the justices or not? They're there for life, so... Yeah, I I don't think that they're unmindful of it, but I think that they kind of do the same thing year in and year out. They go in and they decide the cases, you know, the way they feel that they should be decided. You know, they may try to be more unanimous in a particular case or decide an issue more narrowly. And and I do think that they're generally kind of an incremental and minimalist court in the sense that I think that they do try to decide. uh, And many times they try to decide the least that they can decide. So, well, I don't think that they're unmindful of it. They read the newspapers. I don't think that they let it shape their behavior. I think that they, uh, I'm kind of one of those Pollyanna-ish people <laughs> who think that they really try to just do justice or they try to follow the law in every case. You were talking about the oral arguments as someone who's argued. I mean, do the lawyers like the arguments that often do go on for hours? You know, I actually had a conversation with several other kind of repeat players the other day on this. And I think generally uh, one thing we like about it is that it really does, allow everybody to be kind of heard fully. And I think that that generally is a favorable thing. The downside is that it makes it harder to argue more cases, that you can essentially fully ventilate one controversial case per day. But if you have a second argument, it's going to get much more summary treatment. And, you know, that that makes it kind of more difficult for the court to hear more cases. And they've been cutting down on the number of cases that they take each year. And it's kind of at low low ebb right now. You know, it's it kind of more in the 60 case range. And I don't know if they're related or not, since they don't I- explain what they're doing. I don't know if they're related. <laughs> yeah. But one consequence of the longer oral argument format is that it makes it harder to hear two cases. 
Thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate your insights, especially knowing that you've argued some 10 times before the justices. That's John Elwood, head of the Appellate and Supreme Court practice at Arnold and Porter. The Supreme Court handed down two decisions today, and neither of them was unanimous. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, we'll get an update from Donald Trump's hush money trial. This is Bloomberg. Stormy Daniels finished her testimony today at Donald Trump's hush money trial. The question is, did the adult film star help prosecutors prove the former president falsified business records? Joining me now is Bloomberg legal reporter David Voriakis, who's covering the trial for us. All in all, what was your take on Stormy Daniels' testimony? Was she credible or not? Stormy Daniels gave impassioned testimony that she had a sexual encounter with Donald Trump in a Lake Tahoe hotel room in 2006, and that despite very intense cross-examination, that she was not backing down from that account, and that she was not motivated by making money, even though Trump's lawyer, Susan Necklace, crossed her on how she had made more than a million dollars in various commercial ventures based on her account of having sex with Trump and how she had changed key details of that encounter a number of times since this happened 18 years ago. And so what Trump's lawyer was trying to do was raise serious doubts about her credibility before the jury. And Stormy Daniels was able to stick to her basic account. She sparred with Trump's lawyer, Susan Necklace, and while she wobbled a bit, she stuck to her core story and was not shaken off of that. Seems like the testimony is going from, you know, compelling witness to the paperwork. And it is a case about business records. So who was on the stand next? The next witness was a publishing executive. And then we heard from uh, Madeline Westerhout, who was Trump's assistant um, just outside the Oval Office, who testified about how she handled Trump's payment of personal bills. Um, This matters in this case because, of course, Trump is accused of falsifying corporate records to hide his repayment to Michael Cohen of $130,000 that he paid to Stormy Daniels. And And I should also say that after the, the final witness today, Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, renewed a mistrial motion that he'd made on Tuesday saying that the judge allowed a great deal of prejudicial testimony by Stormy Daniels about the sexual encounter that was improper. The judge said that essentially the defense had opened the door to that by attacking her credibility in their opening statement and saying that the sexual encounter did not occur. And so the judge said, well, the prosecutor was then allowed to bring her on to say that, yes, it did occur. Todd Blanche also asked the judge to modify his gag order on Donald Trump to allow him to respond to the Stormy Daniels testimony. The judge refused to do that. And did that argument get heated? Yes, it was quite a heated argument for a good while after the end of trial testimony. And um, Joshua Steinglass uh, came back for the prosecutors and essentially said, you know, that all of Todd Blanche's arguments were misguided and uh, that the prosecution did nothing improper in eliciting Stormy Daniels' testimony about what happened in the hotel room in the Tahoe in 2006. Since Tuesday, has Trump been following the gag order? There have been no complaints from the prosecutors that he has violated the gag order. He's obviously very angry about Stormy Daniels' testimony. The judge admonished him in a sidebar when he was um, cursing at Stormy Daniels on Tuesday. But um, as far as I know, he hasn't said anything publicly about Stormy Daniels or any other witnesses to violate the gag order. Essentially, Todd Blanche asked the judge to 
to allow the shackles off so that Trump could talk freely to the public and on the campaign trail about Stormy Daniels. And the judge said that that would imperil the integrity of the proceedings, and he denied it. What does the jury have to believe from Stormy Daniels' testimony to make the prosecution's case? I mean, did the prosecution even have to call her as a witness? That's an excellent question. It's possible to argue that the prosecution could have made their case without Stormy Daniels' testimony. It doesn't matter whether they really had sex or not. What matters is that he paid hush payment days before the 2016 election to prevent her from going public with her account, whether it's true or not. And the trial, of course, is about, you know, falsifying records to cover up that payment. What the judge said and what the prosecutor said is that the testimony by Stormy Daniels was important because the defense had called her credibility into question and said that this never happened. And so the prosecutor said that they needed an opportunity to put her on the witness stand, essentially to show that she was a credible witness and that her account was important to complete the story, to know why it was that Donald Trump was paying the hush money that he paid. Has the prosecution decided not to call Karen McDougal? The prosecution said they were not calling Karen McDougal. We did not get an explanation from the prosecution on that. We actually learned that from a defense lawyer in an argument before the judge. Who's on the stand tomorrow when they resume? As usual, the prosecutors have not said who they're calling next, but the big remaining witness is Michael Cohen. And that cross-examination may be epic. Thanks so much, David. That's Bloomberg legal reporter David Voriakis. The dramatic 2021 collapse of Archegos Capital Management will be replayed in a criminal trial over the next two months as prosecutors try to convict founder Bill Huang for market manipulation, racketeering and fraud. In announcing the charges a year ago, Damian Williams, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, called it a market manipulation scheme that nearly jeopardized our financial system. The scheme was historic in scope. We allege that the defendants and their co-conspirators lied to banks to obtain billions of dollars that they then used to inflate the stock price of a number of publicly traded companies. The lies fed the inflation, and the inflation fed more lies. Round and round it went. Prosecutors say Wong misled some of Wall Street's biggest banks, into inflating the value of Archegos holdings to as high as $160 billion before the family office imploded, all but erasing his $36 billion fortune. Jury selection has begun in the case, and Bloomberg legal reporter Chris Domesh is covering the trial for us. Tell us about Bill Huang. Who is he? So Bill Huang, he's a tiger cub from Julian Robertson's um, camp at Tiger Management, the late Julian Robertson, legendary trader who trained quite a few people to become traders and and kind of launch their own funds and firms. So Bill started under him, learned the ropes, and then around, I think it's 2001, he started his own firm with some money from Julian Roberts, I think $25 million. So he ran that. It was called Tiger Global Asia, you know, took the name from Robertson and um, mainly traded in Asia stocks, but had to eventually, um, the firm pleaded guilty to a kind of a sock sandal basically involving tips on Asian equities. Um, He didn't admit any wrongdoing, but he settled. But as a result, he formed a family office. It became Archegos um, and basically did the same kind of thing, trading, made a lot of money. And then, as everybody knows, blew up in March 2021 when the trades went south. He's very religious and he sort of likes to spread his faith. I mean, tell me about that aspect of him. Yes, very much. Um, in fact, you know, an interesting part about this trial is we've seen um, Christianity Today, the periodical that covers you know, religion and Christianity, uh, is here for the trial. So that kind of tells you... That's a you, first. 
Yes, definitely. Never seen them before. Um, so definitely preaches his faith. He said he invests basically, you know, he takes his hints from the Bible, tries to invest in things that he thinks, you know, the Lord would want him to invest in. He started his own foundation, the Grace and Mercy Foundation, to further that goal of religious education. He says he reads the Bible religiously. And we won't know how much of that will come up during the trial. And the government pretty much won it to kind of limit that kind of arguments about his good acts and his faith. And the judge kind of said, we're not going to really go into that. It's hard to say how much of that is actually going to come up, but it, one can't imagine that it won't come up at all through the witnesses. Tell us what he's charged with. There are two defendants. So there's Bill Huang, who is the founder, and then the CFO, Patrick Halligan, who's not charged in quite so big of a scheme. So Bill was basically charged with conspiring with traders at the firm to trade. Um, essentially, he traded on swaps. So he was trading on margin, but the government's allegations that he was trading on margin with multiple firms who didn't really realize the level of his exposure. And the allegations are that he did this to manipulate the market and drive up interest in the stocks that he had invested in. So that when, you know, his margin ran out and there's the bank started to make margin calls because he had gotten more credit, suddenly the stock started plummeting because they, they realized suddenly how exposed he was. So he's kind of accused of that market manipulation scheme. And separately, he's also accused with the CFO of attempting to mislead the banks and fool them into not knowing that he had these kind of lines of credit with other institutions. Well, I've read that his strategy in retrospect was like market suicide. And one of his attorneys said he never sold a nickel of his shares. Does anyone know what the point of this was? Well, that's a good question. You know, the judge has questioned the prosecutors, like, what was the goal of this if he lost all his money? So I think that's going to be a main point of the defense here is they argue he wasn't trying to manipulate the market, that he was making honest trades and that, that it fell out for under him. And they essentially argue that the banks did their own due diligence. These are very sophisticated institutions that did their own research that weren't going to extend credit unless they felt comfortable with doing so. And that at the same token, you know, they were required to hedge his trades through the contracts by buying. Whenever he decided to trade the options, they were forced to buy the shares of the underlying stocks as a hedge. Um, he argues that Rather than just a one-for-one one hedge, one share for every time he bought, they were going out and very broadly hedging this. And therefore, kind of, he says that undermines the argument that the banks didn't know what was going on. The key is that the prosecutors say he lied to the banks they were borrowing from and used the swaps to conceal the huge positions that he was in? Right. So this is federal court. So the judge is doing the questioning for the jury selection. This case sounds like it could be a bit complicated. What kind of jurors are they looking for? So it's hard to say on that end, but jury selection has been very interesting in this case. Normally, when we do jury selection, um, every judge is different. But um, generally, you know, they'll bring a lot of jurors into a courtroom. They'll, you know, ask them if they have time constraints. They'll go through their their individual histories to see if, you know, they know any of the witnesses or any of the parties involved in the case. And then they'll just kind of go through what they call voir dire and, and ask them about, you know, what they read, what, you know, what they know about, that sort of thing. In this case, the judge, because it's going to be a two-month trial, brought them all in yesterday, brought in the jurors one by one, and asked them if they could sit for two months. That was really it. And if they could, they went home for the day, and they all came back today, and they began the process of whittling down the jury. So obviously this morning, there's lots of questions about financial institutions, did you work with the counterparties involved? There's more than, you know, three dozen witnesses on the witness list from counterparties here and multiple banks. So they're slowly kind of going through each institution and, you know, people who have had experience with law enforcement. But we really haven't gotten to any kind of individual whittling down. So it's kind of hard to see what the strategy is behind the jury selection at this point. But I will say that the judges made it clear, like many judges do, that he wants a big cross-section of life experiences and things like that on the jury. So there's all kinds of people. We've got general counsel for newspapers. We've got people who worked in finance. We've got people who worked in construction. We've seen just the whole gamut of different occupations through the last two days. 
And now, who's expected to testify? Do we, do we know, like, who the main witnesses will be? Yeah, so the, the two big star witnesses are his former head trader, William Tamita, and the former head of risk management, which was Scott Becker. And they have both pled guilty and agreed to cooperate against him. So they form the majority of the government's case against him. Like I said, they will bring up witnesses from the counterparties, from Credit Suisse and many of the other banks, likely, who will testify about you know their reaction to finding out about how exposed Arcagos was. And we should have also like some analysts from the sell side, and also we'll definitely have multiple experts from both parties. Beyond that, we're still waiting to hear some names of some of the people uh, who will be on the witness list. I understand that the defense may argue that the prosecution is pushing this novel market manipulation theory. Is this the first time the feds have prosecuted a case like this? And maybe this is the first time a case like this has happened. Yeah, it's definitely kind of the first time that the government has kind of brought this kind of broad market manipulation scheme. Um, There have been others, uh, but none of them have been quite as widespread and infamous, really. Many of them have been in kind of niche markets, things like that. And so it's definitely one of the more interesting prosecutions that we've seen a white-collar crime in years. So Wall Street is watching this, I take it. For sure. Now, let's be clear, Archegos doesn't exist. Credit Suisse is bought by UBS. The fallout was broad from this, but it's not like there's going to be a broad impact on the market from what happens here. But it will be a message probably to family offices um, to be more prudent. And, you know, there's no doubt that this is a fascinating episode in Wall Street history to the financial industry. So in that aspect, I think everybody will be watching it. I'm interested in the judge, Alvin Hellerstein. He's known for overseeing the long litigation stemming from the September 11th terrorist attack. And is he 90 years old? Because that gives us all hope for the future. The judge is 90 years old. You would find it hard to believe, uh, given that he went through (laughs) eight-plus hours of jury selection yesterday, and he he candidly admitted he was exhausted at the end, but he was back at it today. Uh, Alvin Hellerstein's a very interesting man. He's clearly got his head in the trial. You don't see many jurors giving uh, age-related excuses. What do we know about the prosecutors in the case? They've all got some sort of experience in uh, white-collar prosecutions here at the Southern District. Matthew Podolsky, who you could probably say is the lead prosecutor, he's co-chief of the Securities and Commodities Task Force, and he was one of the lead prosecutors in the fraud case against the Nicola Corp founder, Trevor Milton, who was sentenced to four years in prison last year for misleading investors about its prospects. Alex Ross Miller, Alexandra Rothman, and Andrew Mark Thomas also have similar experience in white-collar cases, but not as much as Podolsky. And what about the defense attorneys? Well, Barry Burke is um, the defense attorney for um, Bill Huang, along with his colleagues, Jordan Estes and Danny James. He's a very well-known um, white-collar defense attorney, he used to be a trial lawyer for the federal defenders, and uh, he's represented many high-profile white-collar defendants, served as chief impeachment counsel for the House in the first Senate trial of Trump. And also, Mary Mulligan is representing the CFO, Patrick Halligan, and she's a former prosecutor and is a, also a veteran white-collar defense attorney who represented the Trump Organization CFO, Alan Weisselberg. Is there any talk of Huang taking the stand? Well, it's a little early for that. It's a great question in, in every case. It's, it's the question, question, I know. It's um, always the question. Defense case, which is, you know, a month away at the least, we haven't heard a lot of talk about that. And, and usually when it comes to white-collar cases, and really in any kind of case, Defendants aren't required to tell them if they're going to testify until really the last minute. And and often, you know, it's really one of the only cards that the defense can pull out if they're not going to call it a real robust case. So they like to keep that one close to their vest until they really get a sense of when they're going to do it. So I wouldn't expect to hear anything about that until we get really substantially deep into the trial. I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Thanks so much, Chris. That's Bloomberg legal reporter Chris Dolmesh. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news by subscribing and listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg.